my colleagues in the, in the uh, faculty, my guests, students here in the law school, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Harry. The last time that Harry, Randy, and I were together in one place was in the session hall of the Supreme Court on March 7, 2006. TMA had proclaimed the state of national emergency, and the first person they arrested was Professor Randolph Davide. And Harry and I were about to argue then, the case of David versus Arroyo. There is actually a story behind that. The original case title was David versus Executive Secretary. We never told you this family because of the President's immunity from Sudan. Um, I signed the pleadings not knowing that Harry had a different idea. That it should, he said that David versus Arroyo sounded better. He said there was a nice ring to it. And uh, I told his, uh, Harry, you know, there are so many legal complications arising from this. And Harry told me not to worry. And Harry was correct. Uh, in fact, we, uh, we did get the way with Harry to be, um, with, uh, with a case title exactly the way you, you uh, designed it. And thank you, Randy, for sharing your precious time with us this afternoon. But there is actually another part of that story, relevant to our topic today. And I don't know, Randy, if you have confirmed this in your people's reactions to, um, to your arrest. And my way of uh, demonstrating that our theme today of religion in the public sphere uh, is so deeply embedded in the Filipino way of thinking that those events on, uh, you were arrested on March 4, uh, on March 4th of 2006, are viewed by people in a religious way. They say that it was in fact providential that for all the scheming of a president on how to to, you know, to, to aggrandize herself in power. She blundered at the very first moment that the person they arrested was no less than the leading public intellectual in the country. And right in front of ANC cameras. And that is why we can legally construct events as a, uh, uh, as in, in a, a secular way as possible. But perhaps, Half the audience might see it yet in that way, not as a secular event, but as an event in some religious meaning. I also thank Father Rani Abino, welcome Father, priest, law professor of the Philippine Judicial Academy, law dean of the San Pedro Graduate School of Law, and parish priest in Tuguegara. And during the recent floods, he transformed his rectory into a refugee center. Part of my thesis today is a church and state. It's difficult to reconcile. And Father Rani is living embodiment of the dog with determination to reconcile. Thank you, Father. And finally, Professor Oscar Ferrer was my frequent guest in my uh, constitutional law classes in the past. Social work professor, theology professor in a seminary. High school classmate of Father Rani in Batwa, in Tok. Um, and member of the Israelian sect. Maybe uh, Oscar would like to tell you about the Israelians. What's the difference between a sect and a religion? Sect is what you call a religion before it becomes powerful. <laughs> when I first invited Oscar, I didn't know him then. All I knew was that he belonged to the Raelian sect. Uh, he entered my classroom with flowing long white hair and a white beard. He has trimmed it a bit now. I didn't know him from Adam at that time, but I suddenly felt that God the Father had just entered my classroom. <laughs> my, my methodology this afternoon is very different. From what, from the, from the main thing that we, this law school does, uh, what we do is what uh, at Harvard will be referred to as legal formalism. We focus on the doctrine, we focus on the rulings, and we find out how those rulings and doctrines will apply in a certain case. I like to go beyond that. I see doctrine merely as the expression of value judgments and policy preferences calcified into law. They structure our debate. They silence certain voices, they privilege certain groups. And that is why I would rather ask, I'd rather look at the dilemma that we focus on today. As a question of transplanted doctrine, we borrowed this doctrine from abroad. We brought them in the Philippines. They have taken root in the Philippines. And yet they look very, very different from where they, uh, from where they come from. And when I, I entitled my lecture, The East Cape uh, versus uh, Explicit Religiosity in the Public Sphere, my thesis is that what we know today, the inherited doctrine in church and state,
that we have today in the Philippines is actually straightforward American doctrine, lock, stock, and barrel. But the doctrine protects religion by pushing it into the private sphere. And yet in the Philippines, religion has always been in the public sphere. Uh, it was part of the, it was an instrument of colonization uh, during, the, um, into the, in, during the Spanish era. It was uh, part, of the, um, uh, part of the events of 1898, 1896, 1898, our revolution. It was part of ETSA I, well, part of ETSA II. Even for the Filipino left, they would have Christian for national uh, liberation. For us, we are therefore caught in a legal doctrine which characterizes religion and protects it and is able to, to value it only by saying that it is reposed in a sphere of privacy. And yet we know that in our actual lives, it belongs to the public sphere. And that is the doctrine, uh, that is the dilemma that I would like to, um, to, uh, to explore. And when I use the term explicit religiosity, I, I refer to a, um, to a phenomenon that has emerged, I would say, only in the past 15 years. The, um, I, I would call it the in-your-face quality. Of, of religiosity. I, I, I grew up as a very traditional uh, Roman Catholic. My, uh, my father was, um, in his um, senior year at the Ateneo Law School, was elected Prefect of the Sodality of the Holy Mother. Uh, that was like the, uh, the most revered position, apparently, um, at that time, uh, in 1952, uh, for them. And um, that was the, the tradition uh, to, which, um, to which I was born. But, and yet, in the past 15 years, what I have seen was a different kind of religiosity. More public, more aggressive, more explicit. It is akin, if I may use a day-to-day uh, um, -day, um, example, to acts of affection and acts of love, uh, of being uh, sweet to one another. And in contrast, the public display of affection. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the, um, the expression wearing your heart on your sleeve. In other words, there is a tendency today in the affirmation of faith to make it as public and as, um, as explicit as possible. We just had our uh, Ash Wednesday uh, in the Philippines. And I was told when I was a student at Harvard that before, and I was a student in the mid-80s, it wasn't acceptable to wear your cross on your forehead in a professional gathering. Because the, the idea was, your faith is for you alone. It's a matter between you and God. And that by wearing it actually right on your forehead, where everyone can see it, even in a professional meeting, it was seen as a violation of some social problem. I would like then to uh, begin the uh, Okay, wonderful. Uh, is there something I can press? Please, I, I'd like that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I call it the original sin. The original sin of the separation of church and state doctrine in the Philippines. It was born inside the church. So put yourself in the situation of these Filipinos waging a revolution, an armed revolution, animated by anti clergy grievances. And they formalized the cause by writing the separation doctrine in a constitution. And they said on the eve of victory, what do we do? They said, let's go to church. And um, not only that, when they sat down in the Malolos uh, Convention, the first draft that they encountered was this. This is uh, the draft of Felipe Calderon. It instituted the Roman Catholic Church as our official religion. And uh, that was, in fact, the working draft of the, um, of the, um, of the Malolos uh, Congress. And fortunately for us, the version which was adopted was this, by Tomás de Rosario. Recognizing, again, we are now introduced to the language to which we are familiar with, the freedom and equality of all religions as well as the separation of the church and state. If you look at the proceedings, Tomás de Rosario was a lawyer trained in, the, uh, in Europe. So he was bringing with him the, um, in, in other words, his intellectual baggage when he brought this to the Philippines was that basically of the ICT, the, the idea of the secular state. And uh, it was said that Tomás del Rosario delivered a, a five-hour lecture before the, before the Congress, which sort of changed the, um, the, the, the complexion of the entire debate. And that is why, eventually, it won the day. 
But the other historical footnote is that, and it is fully, very well documented, I'm just reminding you about this. This was won the vote. Well, there was actually a deadlock the first time it was voted upon. 25 to 25. The deadlock was broken only on second ballot because someone who abstained decided to cast a ballot in favor of this. And as soon as it was approved, it was Mabini himself who asked the provision be suspended so that they could preserve unity as they prepared for the American invasion. In fact, that was why they, was, they were in Manolos. They were already out of the They couldn't do it in Manila. Um, this is the last that we will see of the, of, the, of the continental European tradition in the Philippines. Because when we draft, when we trace the history of the Philippine Constitution, there is a clean break from Malolos. And after Malolos, we will then shift to what is, strictly speaking, the origin of the Philippine constitutional tradition, which is the organic acts foisted upon the Philippines by the new U.S. colonial power. And the next is uh, uh, President William McKinley's instructions to the, to the Philippine Commission. Um, so this is the language that we will now inherit and which we will reaffirm over and over again in the various constitutions that we have. I will just do a very brief um, survey. This is from the 1900 McKinley's instructions. Um, notice also, and uh, this is rather a digression, so he says, the city, its inhabitants, churches, and religious worship are placed under the special safeguard of the faith and honor of the American army. In the firm hope that through our labors, the inhabitants of the Philippine Islands, the had it called the Filipino yet, may come to look back with gratitude to the day when God gave victory to American arms in America and set their land under the sovereignty and protection of the people of the United States. Um, it's a bit ironic reading it uh, here at um, at UP um, a, decade, um, a decade later. But notice then that when they established their constitutional order in the Philippines, the separation of church and state was one of the very first battles we affirm. But they affirm. I now go into a certain episode in our history, the purchase of the friar lands. So recall, you're very familiar with our, with our history, that grievances over the friar lands was uh, one of the, uh, the animating reasons for the revolution. And the U.S. colonial government was painfully aware of it. And they said that they were going to deal with those uh, friar lands. They acknowledged the history of, of grievances. They acknowledged the, the strife and bloodshed. But they said that no injustice will be done. They will protect all the rights to property, including the right against the taking of private property without due process of law. This will actually be codified in the instructions to William Howard Taft, the first civilian governor of the, um, uh, of the Philippines. And Taft will receive instructions coming home from Manila to the US to drop by Rome to purchase all the friar lands. That by reason of the separation, the religious orders, the Dominicans, Augustinians, Recoletos, and Franciscans. I was actually looking for the Jesuits, but uh, I don't know, I'm missing it. Um, can no longer perform on behalf of the state the duties in relation to public instruction and public charities formerly resting upon them. And they now find themselves the objects of such austerity and the part of their territory. And they will not be voluntarily accepted again by the people except by force on the part of the civil government, which the principles of our government, namely the US government, would forbid. And notice the, the instruction. Your error will not be in any sense diplomatic in nature. It will be purely a business matter of negotiating by you for the purchase of property from its owners. So we then encounter the first conversion of what began as the dominance of the, of the, of the monastic orders in the Philippines. And now in the hands of the US colonial government, we have, it has morphed into basically a real, real estate transaction. We depoliticize it, we de, uh, uh, despiritualize the whole dispute, we see purely as a, um, as a dispute over, um, over property. I will now trace the evolution of the language all the way when we began with, the, uh, with McKinley's instructions. We then proceed to the Philippine Bill, and I will end the tracing of, this, um, of, of the language for the 87 Constitution. So for law students, this language is very familiar. This is the, um, our uh, religion clause 
that we inherited from, uh, from the uh, United States and that will be reaffirmed in subsequent instruments. This is the Philippine Bill of 1902, the Jones Law of 1916. Again, these are provisions that you will recognize in our current uh, 1987 Constitution. The tidings of Coffee Law. Similar language in both 35 and, um, and, um, and 73. And I will now uh, begin to uh, parse the language. Uh, notice the uh, first, there shall be no law be, shall be made respecting an establishment of religion. We call that the, the establishment laws. The second is, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That is the free exercise uh, laws. And uh, the next is the neutrality clause. No discrimination or, or religious uh, preference. The next is the no religious test clause. Uh, just to show you how difficult uh, these rules have been for us, the Philippine Supreme Court was confronted at some point with a very famous uh, uh, case, Amil versus Tegano, where uh, our old administrative code prohibited ecclesiastics from holding public office, elected public office. And it was tested as against this rule. And the Philippine Supreme Court couldn't muster enough votes to strike down the ban. When in fact the ban was categorically, so obviously in violation of a clause in the Constitution. And despite that, the Supreme Court justices went on and on warning about the union of church and state and saying why the administrative code provision should, should stand. This now is the language that we have in our post-Marcos Constitution of 1987. Um, what we have done is, first of all, to elevate the principle within our, within what I call the normative clauses of the Constitution. I think uh, Justice Feliciano referred to the Declaration, to the Article II Declaration of Principles as a, a, an inventory of the values that are adopted by the United States. And one of those values is the separation of church and state. The next clause is found in our Bill of Rights, similar to that of the, um, of the U.S. Constitution. Again, the language is very similar. This clause is actually to carry out the, um, the, 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 the non-establishment uh, principle. And again, um, my, my students are, um, are perhaps tired of this um, story. Uh, notice that we've got the UP chapel right here, at, uh, right here, well, a stone's throw away from the law school. How on earth can we explain and reconcile uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Catholic Church on UP uh, with this clause? I actually asked uh, Justice, um, Chief Justice Enrique Fernando how it came about. He told me that um, his first draft, he was asked for his legal opinion by the Board of Regents. His first draft was to say that it cannot be reconciled. You cannot have a Catholic Church in government land. And then he said his wife spoke to him. His wife was from Puska. And so he changed his draft to a legal opinion. But he said he showed it to Laurel, Jose P. Laurel, the, the protege of George, uh, George Malcolm, and who was then on the Board of Regents of UB. And Laurel said that it can be reconciled using the free exercise laws, that if you drag all those students of UB, from um, from the old campus in Padre Fawa, drag them to the um, to the boondocks of um, Lima. Then you are duty bound to provide them a place of worship, and uh, so that they can enjoy their free exercise. So again, just to show you the difficulties, I understand that now the Catholic Church at UP pays rent uh, to uh, to UP. Again, that is a mechanism by which you secularize the uh, the transaction. In other words, they become secular in the eyes of UP, and no different, therefore, from um, from a uh, from any store, or a bookstore, or a restaurant operating um, in campus, paying rent uh, for the um, for the um, the, um, uh, these are uh, the provisions uh, related to the place of religion in our politics. And notice, we still carry out the strict separation of the two spheres, the religious sphere and the, um, in the secular sphere. We have also seen the circumventions of many of these rules 
we have partidist groups, which are actually uh, extensions of, of evangelical groups. Uh, and uh, they, they have representatives in Congress carrying out the, um, uh, the, uh, the beliefs of their, um, uh, of their religious um, of their religious. Um, notice also this clause on the head superior or administrator of any religious organization who coerces, intimidates, compels, or in any manner influences any of his subordinates or parishioners uh, uh, to, to support or vote for any candidate. Uh, this clause was actually tested before the Supreme Court uh, in the um, uh, in the uh, petition of the uh, Social Justice Society. I'm sure you've heard about the, uh, this society in another context. But um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court threw out the, um, uh, the, uh, the case on procedural grounds in order to avoid having to pronounce on the substance of the, of the challenge posed by SJS uh, on the practice of, uh, of religious groups adopting or endorsing candidates. So in that case, the petitioner was Mike Pelang. And he was the he, uh, in the past elections, we have, we have seen politicians openly courting the support of, um, of, Mike, of Brother Mike. And, um, uh, and in this case, the Supreme Court refused to chastise him. The, um, I would now like to proceed uh, to um, a, uh, just a survey of some clauses that you will encounter later. What I will do is I will develop uh, two theses on two possible approaches to church and state and examine how and, and try to apply them uh, to one raging debate that is on uh, reproductive health. So these are the clauses that you will encounter later. Uh, formalized by the Constitution uh, of 1987. The state recognizes the sanctity of family life and shall protect and strengthen the family as a basic autonomous social institution. Um, again, notice, thus far, what you have is to protect certain decision making by saying that they are autonomous, by pushing them within the sphere of privacy. It shall equally protect the life of the mother and the life of the unborn. The state shall defend the right of spouses to found their family in accordance with their religious convictions and the demands of the spouse. This is about religious instruction, uh, the option to take religious instruction within public schools. Um, and uh, I, will, I just want to survey for you the, the provisions that you will be applying uh, in a short while. The state recognizes the complementary roles of public and private institutions in teaching. Notice this is already a deviation from the original model proposed by, by William Howard Taft, saying that maybe we must reduce the role of uh, Catholic Church, uh, of Catholic schools in the instruction of, uh, of our students. Significantly, the very first Filipino dean of the UP College of Law, he was dean for 70, year, 70 years, he was a Protestant, Jorge Pope, um, uh, and um, uh, Jorge was, um, was uh, uh, I would say, was faithful to that original model explained by, uh, by Taft. Um, this is the uh, uh, the exemption of the tax exemptions of, uh, of, of churches, either as churches or as, uh, as uh, I would now like to proceed uh, to the um, to the fact situation. Uh, the latest survey that we have on the distribution of um, of churches in the Philippines would show that we are predominantly well 81 percent Roman Catholic. But please jump to the bottom. Um, uh, but four out of ten Catholics and seven out of ten Protestants would identify themselves as either Pentecostal or, uh, or charismatic. I believe the man. Uh, but uh, what we find here is uh, a, a picture which we have consistently sustained for the past, uh, well, in the history of our constitutional tradition, anyway, for the past century, of a, a community which is predominantly uh, Roman Catholic. If you look at the first, um, the Philippine Commission's report when they took over the Philippines, their figures would not have a, would not have this kind of a breakdown. For them, it was Catholic and everyone else. That is how they um, uh, classified it. The first dilemma, and I'm now shifting from the provisions and their history to the dilemma. The first dilemma is this: the premises 
of the separation doctrine as we apply it here in the Philippines. Assume both a traditional theology and a traditional um, state. And uh, Father Rani, uh, feel free to correct my own summary of, um, of, um, of theology. And also um, Oscar, I think uh, you teach in uh, seminary. Uh, I will start with the with the liberal state. The liberal state would limit the functions of the state to what what is traditionally referred to as the night watchman functions. You run the police, you run the jails, you run the courts, you collect the garbage, uh, you make sure there are no um, epidemics. But beyond that, you, you don't have any ministry functions. That would be the function of the next slide, actually, that I will show. In other words, the state limited itself in terms of the protection of rights, just a civil and, um, and political rights, and nothing more. And that is why, when we spoke before of the separation of church and state, this was a state that we were trying to keep at bay, away from religion. But on the other side, if you look at uh, theology, tradition, it was temple-based, prayer-focused, um, uh, uh, faith, a focus on the salvation of souls. In other words, um, when we spoke traditionally of a church that we wanted to insulate from the state, it was a church which, which had a very well circumscribed um, scope that limited itself uh, to, uh, to the preaching of doctrine um, and did not venture too far away from the temples of worship. Both the state and theology have changed. And that is why what we have is the application of the same legal doctrine in a different context. In which case there is the inevitable overlap. Again, I will begin with the state. The part I want We have expanded from the SFAF state to a welfare state. We have lots of social justice clauses, especially in the 87 uh, Constitution. Clauses which have um, uh, uh, you know, pushed us, in the words of Justice Feliciano, uh, into the, uh, the uncharted waters of social and economic uh, policy making. Um, and that is why that state has expanded its scope beyond the night watchman functions into ministering to our economic and social needs. It looks at education, it looks at, um, uh, well, mentions the family, it, it, it looks at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the regulates the, uh, the economy of heaven. But that is just on the side of the state. On the side of religion, it has also expanded its reach, at least for the religion I am familiar with. And um, it speaks of a preferential option for the poor. Uh, there are all sorts of liberation um, uh, theologies. It speaks of community-based um, uh, worship. It speaks of the expansion of worship, of worship to cover even our earthly needs, and therefore of an activist church that goes beyond uh, the, um, uh, the seminaries, goes beyond the temples. And when both the state and the church expand their functions, inevitably they will overlap. And that is the overlap that we now witness. And the problem is that we are still armed with the same doctrines and interpretations that we had before the overlap emerged. What what we have, therefore, is the application of a doctrine that we imported from the United States, transplanted to the Philippines, on a soil that is completely alien. I'll start with the first. They evolved their church and state doctrine on the assumption that there are so many religions competing out in the open market, trying to win converts, and, uh, uh, you know, and playing the game in the open, in the free marketplace of ideas. I do not think that pluralistic market exists in the Philippines. What we have is a very dominant presence by one church too deeply rooted in, um, in our secular lives. Such a speed of pluralistic competition, what we have is a, is a non-level, it's a skewed uh, playing field. That is the evolution of the assumption of, of a libertarian milieu, of everyone free to pick and choose his um, religion. And then I am making some assumptions here that are sticking us religions. Religions chosen by our, by our parents. And that will, well, maybe here I'm speaking totally for myself. I find it difficult to my parents, my, uh, my, my, my religion. And third, 
Religion has always been the public sphere, as I, as I know. And which brings us then to a problem that each time there is the assertive, uh, there is an assertive position taken by, let us say, the CBCP on a secular issue. The defense is that the separation of church and state is a one-way state. It is a constraint upon the state, not upon private churches, not upon private citizens. We call that the state action uh, requirement. Um, before I proceed to apply this then uh, to the debate on uh, reproductive health, I would just like to uh, trace for you the evolution of the, uh, of the language. The term wall of separation is actually drawn from uh, Thomas Jefferson. And uh, it, was, it is in fact Jefferson who most clearly articulated the protection of religion as belonging to the private sphere. And uh, I will contrast him later to the Madisonian approach, which on this uh, issue, on which uh, they, they actually agree. But for Jefferson, the wall of separation has to be maintained. The uh, state, uh, 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 church and state must be completely uh, separate. No church should have to rely upon the sword of Caesar to spread uh, its, um, its reach. Notice, however, uh, the, the side of Madison is the debating partner in their constitutional tradition. In his, uh, his, uh, his famous memorial and remonstrance, it was an objection to the allocation of public funds for, uh, for the teaching of, um, of religions. And at this stage, he is actually explaining why the separation of church should be maintained, not, as, not because it is in the private sphere, but precisely because it is in the public. Um, in the public sphere. And perhaps it's a bit um, ideologically alien to our um, constitutional tradition. But I recognize some themes from a from material that I used to read uh, before I entered law school. Um, Marx said that there is actually no distinction between the secular uh, uh, state and religion. Because for him, the way he put it, in bourgeois society, we have disintegrated into at atomized uh, individuals bereft of any sense of community. And that is why we have to create, we have to recreate that fictive communal world in two spheres, in both the public sphere and the private sphere. And he said that, therefore, both state and religion are merely embodiments of that fictional uh, communal self, that species being. And that therefore, it is these fictions by which we put ourselves into a, uh, a, um, a community. I will now try to test uh, these um, approaches on a, um, on a raging debate in our country. I have here the official catechism issued by the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines to guide, you know, to guide the clock when they voted in the 2010 election. It says, the separation of church and state prohibits the state from interfering in church matters and prohibits the state from having a state religion. That is the, uh, the part I mentioned to you earlier. That is a state action requirement. But it does not imply a division between belief and public actions in moral principles and political choices. In fact, the freedom of religion upheld by our Constitution protects the rights of believers and religious groups to practice their faith and act on their, on their values in public life. So up to this point of the game, perhaps you should tell me, see, we should really stick it out with the Jeffersonian formula. You stick it out with the private sphere, because the moment you push uh, the religion debate into the public sphere, you encounter the Catholic Bishops Conference uh, of the Philippines. This morning I read that uh, Carlos Seltran, the guy who walked around with the Damas sign, had to apologize already. So you know, you're, you're a rather formidable uh, 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 protagonist here. So, the CPCP says, our intention is not to tell Catholics from home or against whom to vote. That responsibility belongs to each individual. Again, consistent with the premises of liberalism. But it would be morally, it would not be morally permissible to vote for candidates who support anti-family policies, including reproductive health, or any other moral evil, such as abortion, divorce, assisted suicide. Human nature. Otherwise, one becomes an accomplice to the moral evil in question. Thus far, 
they are actually asserting the free exercise of religion. In other words, they said, our religion taught us certain things. We are, we are free, we're actually duty bound to carry it out in our, in our private lives and free uh, and protected in doing so by our Philippine constitution. Um, Of, of mechanisms 
by which entire groups of communities will bring their weight to bear upon individuals making private choices, and by thus characterizing the, um, uh, uh, the power of the state on and of organized religions as equally public in character, we will be able to sort out the, um, the, the, uh, the clash between characterizing uh, worship as a private act to be performed in the privacy of, of one's temple of, or of one's conscience, as against a practice which has emerged today of foisting uh, the um, uh, what began as private acts as public policies. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Mamalana. We now call on our first discussant. Um, our discussant is a full professor, and prof first discussant is a full professor and professor emeritus uh, at the Department of Sociology at the College of Social Science and Philosophy. University of Philippines to demand. He has been a faculty member of UP since 1967, uh, teaching courses in general sociology, sociological theory, political sociology, sociology of knowledge, and sociology of developing societies. He's the author of four books, and his essays have appeared in numerous journals and scholarly publications here and abroad. Uh, as Randy David, he developed an active second career in the media, writing and uh, uh, hosting one of the longest running public affairs talk shows on Philippine television, Public Forum. Uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, our first discussant is, as mentioned by Dean Pangalangan, considered as one of the country's leading public intellectuals. Let us all welcome Professor Randolph DeVille. start with a disclosure, a series of disclosures. Number one, the tenth member of my family, number 13, is a Catholic bishop and is a member of the permanent council of the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines. My second disclosure is that I am not a church goer. My third disclosure is that I have not been admonished. <laughs> either by my brother or any of my siblings or by my parents. They consider it a natural accompaniment of studying the new people. Lose your faith. Fourth disclosure is that I did not raise any of my children, and there are four of them that are all new students at Richard University in any religious faith. Three of them are Catholics, Discovered the religion. The fourth one, a scientist, I think, is an agnostic. I say those things because uh, I, I view the issues that were brought up by the board this afternoon entirely from a social scientific point of view. Choice, I Up as much as more than 
the ground for the most interesting debates in the Manolo's Congress, which by the way, according to all the corpus, remains the best of our institutions. It's elegant. It's one of the divisions that really made the debates very, very interesting. It's the division between the fervent Catholic see that the that vision eloquently exhibited in the debates. The, the, the assembly men were themselves divided between the fervent Catholics, mostly educated in the Philippines, the Freemasons, mostly educated. So I would say that uh, the, the intellectual baggage that the problem called uh, Master Rosario was basically a legacy of the It was part and parcel of the process of modernity sweeping, that it began to sweep Europe beginning in the mid 18th century, reaching it was high point in the French Revolution, 17th century. Having said that, I decided to write my main comment just on an Amman's paper for certain reasons. But I want, first of all, to thank the college of the particular group for asking me to comment on this rich, finally, extremely provocative paper. This paper is also, by the way, unique in that it offers a critique of a legal situation that is informed by constitutional history, sociological, anthropological, and political analysis. It is analytical in tone, however, it does not hesitate to wade into normative waters. It is a full menu, in other words, and this makes it difficult to comment on everything. Later, perhaps, in the general discussion, if there is time, I shall try to touch on some details in the argument that one can qualify or interpret differently in order to come up with a different set of conclusions. For now, let me just briefly address what I consider the key points that are of particular interest to me as a student of sociology. Number one. The main point of the paper, I believe, is this. That 
the doctrine of church state separation. The reason why in our constitution is basically an American, or in any case, imported Muslim, that found its way into our constitutional tradition. As I already said, it's probably not so much American as Western modern. Repository of the Enlightenment tradition, more than America, <coughs> because the Master of Chaga himself was educated in Europe. In any case, important, a concept that found its way into our constitutional tradition. Its underlying assumptions belong, as we will argue, to a different social political milieu that one can roughly characterize as realistic. The religious freedom it protects is that of the quote unquote the encumbered individual who is sociologically free to choose his own religion and for whom religious affiliation is essentially a private or personal concern. Probably best articulated by the American philosopher William James said that one's religion is what one does with his own solitude. And moreover, the non-establishment or neutrality stance assumed by the state pertained to a situation where no dominant religion exists on the ground. These conditions, as we will argue, do not exist in Philippine society. Because of this, the constitutional doctrine of church-state separation has not been effectively realized. At worst, it has even worked unwittingly in favor of the dominant religion, Roman Catholicism. Raoul cites numerous instances in which this constitutional dysfunction, it's a word that I use, has manifested itself in our recent history. I would like to say at the outset that I basically agree with this argument. Indeed, many of the controversies and crises that have recurrently besieged our society and polity spring from the basic reality that the institutions we borrow from abroad, particularly from the United States, and transplanted into our own society have often produced unexpected and sometimes contradictory results. In sociology, as we say, the conditions of their possibility have not sufficiently ripened in our own society. But to put it more bluntly, our institutions, beginning perhaps with our own constitution, are far too modern and democratic for the kind of society we have. Society that has remained hierarchical, segmentary, or refugee. But having said that, I want to offer the proposition that this situation owes nothing to the fact that we are Filipinos and Asians. It has nothing to do with any intrinsic cultural attribute or visibility. I would argue instead. This situation has everything to do with the fact that we are a nation that is trying to make modern political institutions work within a society that is still in the process of negotiating a tortuous transition to modernity. And to say that is also to say that we are not at a standstill. Our society has been changing in ways we cannot imagine, shaped by forces both external and internal. We call it modernity. The evolution of a society that is differentiated along functional lines rather than along the traditional lines of a preordained hierarchy or along familial, ethnic, or regional identities. We are not just quite there, but are ways our existing institutions may suggest. Clearly, what Raoul 
observes about the religious system in the Philippines is true as well for our economic system. It is true as well for education, the mass media, and of course, the political system itself. These institutional spheres are very much the hubs of the traditional elites. Sorry, but hopefully, this situation is changing. Be it uneven here. The pace of the transition varies for every sphere. We think we need empirical studies that document the transition to modernity throughout the Philippines. But I think that all of you here may disagree with me. We can say that the transition to religious pluralism in the sphere of faith has already begun. I think it can be argued that the wanted hegemony of the Catholic Church is far less evident today than it was in the past. People, even those who call themselves Catholics, are bolder and more open in expressing their disagreement with church policy. Many of my friends have recounted walking out of sermons these days when they feel that they cannot agree with what the priest is saying during the sermon. I believe that only a minority of Catholics still feel threatened or terrorized by the threat of excommunication. For many of them, it is a laughable threat that the church is where the government permission is. Indeed, the electoral clout of the Catholic Church or of the clergy has not been in doubt. Every survey organization, whether it's organization or as the Williams, will tell you there is no such thing as a Catholic government. Even the top clergy's wanted influence on our political leaders is no longer perceived as proper. Although, of course, where before it may have been taken for granted or snatched up. On the contrary, on the contrary, it has been the smaller churches or sects who have not made any effort to conceal their control of the voting preferences of their members. One can hardly regard this as a reaction to the hegemony of the Catholic Church.
and uh, I also came to be a certain that next time I invite you to San Beda to lecture, it will not be difficult to do so. Beth has not fulfilled her promise for a long time. I am very pleased to meet somebody I have seen since seminary days. Oscar here was my uh, was one year after us at Mary Hurst Seminary. I was kicked out of seminary because I was deemed unfit to be a missionary. He was seen fit. <laughs> Uh, I don't teach theology these days, he continues to talk I decided to be one of the key functions of God to bring about social cohesiveness. There are different concepts of social cohesion, and have had to find their way to finding the degree of how peoples are to live by. On one end of the spectrum are those who advocate a high degree of control. The result, of course, is a society where uniformity is dominant. North Korea being an obvious example. But one can refer to other examples as well. On the other end are those who are of the persuasion that cohesion is best achieved when it safeguards the optimal sphere of autonomy for each individual while endeavoring to promote the common good, which itself lends itself to different acceptations. Obviously, pluralism will be a problem where control is a prime commodity. But there is a certain unavoidability to pluralism, which is common of the post-enlightenment period. In fact, one way to understand Laiste is to take it to be necessary entailment of the deconstruction of the narrative of the clergy, so that the alternative texts and petite narratives of the laity, or those who had no religious power, might be heard and entertained. Laicite is the political and the legal rubric that the Agora be kept open to discourse that in the past would have been silenced for being heretical, sinful, and immoral. In that respect, Laicite is an imperative of justice. For as Derrida has insisted, the imperative of deconstruction is the imperative of justice. Dr. Pangalaran has alluded to the transplant that has occurred in our history and in our culture. This is just one of the facts of Philippine social organization and Filipino life of which juridical constructs must be cognizant. In this respect, my reaction to the brilliant treatise of an esteemed colleague Raul takes the form of exploring, exploring the needs that he provides. In what has become the current articulation of the state's position towards religion or creedal allegiance in this jurisdiction, the Supreme Court in Estrada versus Espitor, which was originally an administrative case, and usually administrative cases are dealt with by a big slip from the Supreme Court embodying a minute resolution, but that triggered, that triggered 300 pages of jurisprudential rumination characterizes the Constitution's formula as benevolent neutrality. The state will accommodate religion when such accommodation does not violate law and public policy. There is, of course, a hint of circularity in the formula, but it seems good enough to me both as a standard of conduct as well as a hermeneutical principle in the interpretation of statutes and subordinate legislation that touch on religious matters. Using the model of system and life world developed by Habermas, I am aware that there are certain criticisms leveled against it, nevertheless, we will find Christian, in fact Catholic morals, a Catholic worldview, and Catholic doctrine constitutive in several respects and in varying degrees of subtlety and explicitness in the life world of most Filipinos. Both Professor David and Professor Pangalana are in the See, that's the dominant thing in this country. Concurring with Habermas's position of legitimacy, the mass of unquestioned beliefs, value orientations, and normativity cannot be irrelevant. Many of the premises of any response to validity challenges will be religiously colored and will arise from a sectarian position. In fact, much of our religiosity has found its way into the fundamental law. 
leading one invited lecture of the Philippine Judicial Academy, I think Rowan was there at that time, an American jurist, to comment that our constitution reads less like a constitution and more like a theological treatise. The question, therefore, is whether or not the constitutionally ordained neutrality of the state conceptually and pragmatically entails the a-religiosity of the state. The Supreme Court has thus far answered in the negative. I share this position. If legitimacy ultimately, ultimately rests on the rationally motivated consent of dialoguing associates, then the shore on which history has deposited us, a metaphor Foucault uses with interesting frequency, cannot be a matter of indifference. We will speak, argue, discourse, and consent from a perspective that, as Raoul has rightly assessed, is predominantly Christian. But it must also be remembered that Christian and Catholic have long ceased to be monolithic. The raging debate on the RH bill proves my point, and in this respect, I hold and have held a position that maintains an appreciable distance from what to me is an unfortunate position maintained by many bishops who claim to speak in behalf of the Catholic Church. In many respects, the Catholic Church has gone the way of what Giddens characterizes as shell institutions. Institutions that retain the trappings and the appearance of what they once were, but no longer are. I hope I am not misinterpreted. I do not want to be divested of my priestly faculties tomorrow. <laughs> I am not saying that the Catholic Church has ceased to exist and that the, world, that the word Catholic has suffered the death of a thousand qualifications. But the fact is that Catholic and Christian have not been spared the quivering that takes place in what and what's more I must attribute correctly to Giddens, lest I be the next online charged with plagiarizing, with what Giddens has described as a runaway world. Observe that when the church reminds the faithful about the discipline of Lent, for example, only a hardy, faithful few will heed. But the press describes the church as influential and will hearken to the pronouncements of its spokesmen, whether real or self-appointed, when they comment on contentious issues, politics, environmental depredation like mining, charges of graft and corruption against government officials. In short, adherence to the church is determined no longer by its doctrine, but by the issues it takes up in the degree of their relevance to public debate. It must also be clear, however, to the Catholic, that if he or she is to participate in the discourse of consociates that is demanded by legitimacy, he must do so in terms that are intelligible in the public sphere. That has been my problem with the debate over the RH bill. If all we have are humane vitae and evangelium vitae, they don't qualify us to take part in the debate in the public sphere. The church must learn to engage in political theology, in public theology. What my friend Oski has to say about this, I will leave to his to himself and to his conscience. <laughs> this may be one of the most profound demands of Lazy Day, what Habermas calls the translation proviso. In terms of the RH Bill debate, if one maintains that it is wrong even to allow citizens the choice for artificial means of contraception, then the demand of public theology or the translation proviso is not one advance the arguments that can figure in an exchange of equals, not in the discourse of fellow believers alone. There is no problem with a conviction that springs from religious grounds. But when one wishes to participate in the debate of the public sphere, one must advance an argument that does not depend on chapter and verse, 
of a particular scripture, but that can meet the challenge hurled at any validity claim. Having said all that, it would be well to be taught by the phenomenon of militancy and fundamentalism, twin phenomena that Caput and Giddens have brilliantly studied. You will have militancy when there is a threat that what has led one security is swept away in unrelenting change. The deluge of a runaway world. Because no one wants to be adrift. And he will swing with all the wrath and fury that militants and fundamentalists have shaken our secularist swag. It is deplorable that our fundamentalists, that there are fundamentalist militants. And the only means that makes it take is not without its risks, and that it will be dangerous for a secular state to marginalize religion. Thank you. Our next discussion is Professor Oscar Ferrer, Professor of the College of Social Work and Community Development. He's also Director of the Office of Student Affairs, Shubhi Dilemad. Let's welcome Professor Ferrer. Bakit may nananatin 
Pache prelam mo si nilagi ng nikaran di sa pati. Madarani, talaga kung mayroong hegemony in the West, yeah, madalas siya sabi ko sa Department of Theory 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 of
Christian century, like young Catholics, Christian Protestant, to point to billion and Muslim. Pero intolerant yung minority at yung binabati ko sa iyo. Sabi natin, uh, majority population. At medyo dito yung problema kasi bakit gano'n ang tumuhin? Sabi ko, siguro may tignan ka natin. Anong implikasyon nito sa ating araw-araw pag at mayroong isang labi group sa UN bakit masyadong nag-exercise ng hegemony ang mga Christians na yan, may minority naman sila. Kaya minsan, pati yung kalendaryo, nakikita niyo yung influensya nila, Roman calendar, kaya yung Agosto at saka Julio, para kung 31, kasi Roman eh. Agosto 6 at saka Julio 6, ang kailangan sikat sila sa kalendaryo. Pero may naglalabi ngayon sa UN, natanggalin yung Roman calendar kasi meron tayong Chinese calendar, may Mayan calendar, marami. So, may kailangan siguro yung dominance sila kahit hindi. <laughs> Six hapto raw yung Mayan calendar o kaya yung Chinese calendar kaya kung may New Year na iba alam nyo na yun So ito yung parang dominance at saka yung parang nagtungtung at nagbago-bago kasi pinitrace ko ang ugat ng ating religion na siya talaga ang nakaukip sa ating mga puso na natin sa ating mga tuho ay talagang malamala istiso eh meron siyang konting influensya ng Asia na kung babalikan mo sa ating Pilipinas, ito yung indigenous practices ng ating mga pinag-inigita ng mga religious communities. Pero dahil sinapawan ito ng isang monolithic religion na akala nila ay sinasikat, natakpan yung expression. Pero kung tutusin natin, hindi na natin like the one. Uh, next. Pagtitignan natin, pag magandang tignan kung paano yung kaling ipatin na from whose optics, titignan ko sa root Uh, word nito at paano na iluwal ang religion. Mula sa natin, na relegri. Ibig sabihin, makikipag-ugnay, makikipag-connect. Uh, to link. Kanino, makikipag-ugnay. Itidress ko yan later on sa intelligent design. Bakit? Mayroon tayong aparato na ginawa kung bakit sobra-sobra makikipag-ugnay natin. We have to link. No? Relegri is to connect it to link. No? Kasi sabi ko, so lahat, tanggap natin lahat ng religion kasi ito ay mga pag-ugnay. Kanino, hindi pa natin alam. Iba-ibang pangalan, bawat kultura. Maaaring sa mga nauna doon, kay Buddha, baka may connect to Buddha, they connect to Buddha, others connect to Muhammad, uh, others connect to Jesus. Ngayon, ang pinakalitis sa alam namin na nagko-connect yung uh, turbata na dalawa. That's the newest na connection. So sabi ko, magandang tignan na lahat siya, iisang tinutungo. Titignan niyo yung kanilang mga mga dokumento mula sa Tibetan Book of the Dead ng Dalai Lama, kikita nyo, gano'n ang iisa tinutungo sa sa Quran ay parating nababo lang, Arabic ang pagkasulat, hindi Hebrew, pero parang yung tinutungo. Okay. Tapos kung titignan sa from a postmodern perspective, maraming myth at sinasabi niyo, maraming myth, genetic construct, o kaya yung narratives. Kailangan maraming may hindi mentologize, pero hindi tayo tigil sa mga dimetologize kaunay ng religion, ng anang kataya. Kailangan mo dimetologize, pero sa pagnanasa natin na mabago, kailangan matuong tayo sa constructionist. Kaya tinitignan ko saan ang magandang postmodern constructionist. Kasi pag may sinira ka, dapat may itakalit tayo. Yan ang ibig sabihin. At doon ko titignan yung theologizing from experience na dalawang hanay. Ang dominant, yung Constantinian. Uh, Greco-Roman ito, kultura ng Rome. Kaya may hirap itinitin kasi masyadong uh, dualistic ang tingin niya at hindi kaya ng New Labour's Institution. At yung pangatlo na gusto kong tignan, yung makabago ng pag-unawa kasi influential na sa ano yung mabuntahan ngayon, influential ko kayo ng mga Facebook at mga search ng internet. Ibig sabihin, yung information is, yung information highway, may search ang information kailangan magkakit. At si Dr. Mayer sa Sinsonian University Institute, si Craig Bender, na siyang talagang pioneer na human genome na uh, physicist tapos si si Chen, marami, sampung libro yan huwag mo na sa Chen, sabi sa video sa kanyang stay with to heaven meron tayong isang movement dyan sa CSSP grupo ng si Chinese medyo scientific balay doon sa kanilang pagunawa ng manuscript na nakuha sila at yung evidences sa desert at sa Middle East 
So, binabanggit nila mo po. So, sinasabi, sa panahon na information is mahalaga yung unawaan. Hindi kailangan magpagalik. Kasi sinasabi ng sinasamba nila. Mas maganda pa pag unawaan yung pamahalin nyo kami. Kaysa, you just follow, you just have faith. Kasi kilala mo, isang ganda may hindi nyo kaya. Yan ang pangatuan. May dumating, kinaglaw. So, So sa pina, ang term na ginagamit po kapag siya ay state governance ay pastoral magisteri, magisteri, si Pak, si Pak, si Pak, si Pak, pero pastoral, ibig sabihin, secular, kailangan, day-to-day, pastoral. Oh, pero kanina, eklusiology. Eklusiology ng Asia o eklusiology ng dikta ng West, ni Constantine. Kasi iba yung Constantine yung Christ, iba yung Jesus of Nazareth, ibang iba yan. Pati yung Mary, na bago, ang Mary na din na rin ito, kaya kung rinigyan ng mga feminist theologians, Iba ang pagtalakay nila kay Mary kasi pisante si Mary. Habang ang konsente ng King Queen, Queen of the Rose, Gorgis, hindi natin napudigan ang paa. Ibang iba ang ibig sabihin ng Constantine ng perspective. Habang yun yung Christian, hindi pisante si Maria, Jesus of Nazareth, the man, Jesus of Elgin. Tapos pa lang pag-iiwala yan, walang dichotomies. Kaya magsinan yung Jews perspective pa dito. Kaya ba malinaw yung mga Kristiyano pag dinasal yung ama namin? Ang kaharihan ng Diyos, hindi kung saan saan yung ililala, ititirik. Dito, you have to work in the work. Kaya sabi ni Clark Lister ng Brazilian Theologian, Project of God is in this planet. Kaya kailangan niyang mag-incarnate para may tindihan niya yung proyekto niya. So, yan ang dalawang hanay. Pero, meron pang atlo, lalo sa pananaw ng third word, kasi mahirap yung tindihan eh. Ang Thermal Churches, dyan ang base yan. Mas based from Catholic Church. Kasi wala nang Church na ba sa'yo? Wala na lang mamatay na sila. Pero dito, marami kayo nagpaliktad ng missionology namin ngayon. Dati ang nagmimission sa Third World countries, First World. Mukti. Ngayon kami na ang nagmimissionary sa First World kasi kailangan convert namin yung First World. Ganun na ngayon. So, ayan yung Third World perspective of context of the global world. Churches. Tapos, yan, yeah, dalawa, medyo nababo yan sa Council of Trent. At kung titignan nyo sa linya ng Jewish tradition, dito yung Christian tradition, lahat ng umpisa ng movement ay laiko, laos, legsite, hindi na sa Trent. Pero laiko, it's like laos, tawag yan. Pero dito, hindi. Institution, magistrate, namin uh, ng mga gara, pero yun, kung pupunta kayo sa, kung gusto nyo uh, mag-tour ng around the world at maduto kayo at alam nyo, planeta, the first thing na hindi nyo siguro magandang Israel ay you cross the Sinai towards Egypt. Nung nalun ako, 1994, I live with the kibbutz movement of Puchin. Ibang-iba, ibang-iba ang talakay ng religiosity and faith. Kaya kita ko, nung naihindihan, mas namukat ako sa yung sabihin ng Judeo-Christian tradition na Asian context sa Greco-Roman Hellenistic So, ipakita ko lang na mahal ko itong mga tatlo at limang slides kasi doon sa intelligent design theory, hindi niya tinatalakay at Asia niya na from a scientific point of Elohim kaya pag kayo ay mahilig magbasa ng Biblia, yung RSB ang pinaka-original, malapit-lapit, huwag yung English version kasi galing yun sa London, yung pa yung kalakay yan. So, sabi, babasahin yung first pages, nandun ang background, may Christian tradition, may U.S. tradition, no? Ipa-ipa, apat na tradition siya. Eh, Christian tradition yun ang tawag, kaya malapit na. Uh, malapit na. Marinig niya sa seven last words. Oh, uh, that's Jesus. Pero yung pwede na sa Christ. Yan yun. Yan ang tawag ng mga Hudyo. Sige. Ibang iba talakay. Next. So, ang pagtalakay, kung sila lumikha sa alin, ibig sabihin, pareho tayo ng katangiyan. Kaya sinabi niya, let's free them. Humans. At hindi gender uh, bias. Mas maganda yung Tagalog kasi hindi kayo natin ang tawag yun sa English. Kasi macho eh. This great man. Walang mabay. Sabi, oh, I don't know. Yung DNA, nagpapahati na mayroong programa na niligay doon sa DNA. Mula kayo biologist, kaya nga wala. Kaya nag-usapan na niya sa kapila ko. Kaya hindi. Yung DNA, ibig sabihin pareho tayo, we are clones of Yahweh. We are in the image and likeness. We are clones of Yahweh. Ibig sabihin, yung programa na naglika sa atin, pareho sa kanya. Kaya sabi niya, sa Genesis, sabi niya, oh, see how they do by us. Ano yun tayo ha? Sabi, next. At nagpadala sila ng ibang mensahero mula sa Ratustra, patungo kay Buda, kay Moses. Each of them have a message for each given period. So nagre-remind sila. Problema, ginawa yan, nalipat sa Rome. Problema,
ma hindi na bumitaw sa road sa kanya. Eh, nung ngayon, gusto pa rin yung mga natigil. Pero yung iba, na nakalapas na sa outro na nila. Thanks. So, yung panahon na ipapilala, mukhang sinasabi ng mga theologians ngayon ang panahon na ipapilala. Kasi, search the information, mukhang may napapilala. Uy, yan, dito kami, dito kami. Thanks. So, gusto din na mga Rubin, bumalik ulit. Sinasabi ng parusiya, pagbalik nila. Pero, ang dahil nila ngayon, MSC. Siyempre, VIP, ambassador ko. Pero, there was only one person, only one race, isa lang ang tao, nagligta ng MSC. Itong templo ng ito na Sierra 73. So, sa akin, nung na-realize ko yung pagkatapos ng utak, pangungay sa mga sabitan, gano'n ang kailangan. Bukang kailangan. Ang wholeness, kailangan isa buhay ko. Kasi kailangan malika. Ito pa yung DNA ko tayo. Napatay ko sa pagkali ko sa atin. Kagaya nila. So, lumahok ko. Yan ang problema ko. Noong nasa loob ako ng institusyon, dahil ng political influence, eh, holiness na aktibo ko. Ginito kami kasi para nila red card holder kami. Kaya pinanayas kami at sabi nila, mahirap na mauwi at sipahan sa mga komunista. Culture and religion, isinasabuhay natin yan. At yun ang identity, yun ang identity ko. Next. Uh, uh, ang hamon ngayon, sa akin pagtingin, kapag pinag-uusapan ng diskursong ito, isinasa-institutionalize natin ang mga patakaran, ang batas, ang sistema, na is kong tingnan na yung pag-institutionalize ang worldview na nanggaling sa iba't ibang larangan, nanggaling sa Greco-Roman, nanggaling sa Judeo-Christian, nagtatagpo rito sa atin, magandang medyo may pa ayos natin sa ating institusyon. Kaya sa ito, tama na nga kung parkitalisasyon, segmentation, tilat-tilat, may ibang gawain at tipaan, pero mahalaga, ito yung para magkaroon ng division of labor. At siyempre, pag mamanage, mahal ng mga komunidad, may ilang talang mga hindi yan ang gawain. Ngunit, sabi ko, sa daily existence, ang integrito ng lahat ng paghati-hati, ay ang individual pa rin. Kaya sabi ko, hindi na siguro yung issue yun. Bahala na yung institusyon kung saan niya ang gagawin yung identification at departmentalization. So, identification and dichotomy sa akin, confusion ko lang, parang konsepto at imaginary na yung pagtinag-tinag ng church, religion. Hindi, sa Judeo-Christian tradition, wala yan. Ito, sa mundo ito, nag-isa kayo, wholeness, holiness, at yan sabi. So, it's just a management tool to plan, organize, systematize, Pinapatikos ngayon ang ating 
Tapos kung sa kailan ka kay simbahan para supit siya, isang dalawa, medyo dalawa, skisoy talaga yung approach dito. Eh. Kasi minsan ginagamit mo para pasinitative, minsan ginagamit para panlupit. Kaya nung prayle, sinasabi na sword and the cross. Nung mga Amerikano, kaya pa rin the rifle. Sabihin, kaya nagre-reaction mo lang sa konvensyon, kailangan sabkaan natin ito. Bukod sa, siyempre, anong puno sa Pilipinas. Na kung umpisa na, sabi nila, let's evangelize the far east. Kaya ang kasamang nang evangelize, kaisa lang ang laik ko si Magellan lang. Kaya yung first class at timasawa, ang reserve si Magellan. Pero lahat ay mga prayle. O siyempre, sa reward system ni King Philip, sabi niya, lahat na magpapalawak ng kaharihan ko, bibigyan ko ng grand grant. Sabi niya, sa king reward, ano yung grant? Inkomienda, land grant. Yun yung trace kung bakit mayroong maraming kapain ng mga friars. Dahil lahat na nagpalawak ng kapain ni Philip, binigyan ng land grant. Kaya lahat ng mga pay. Ang pinakahuling uh, friar lang yung Mindoro, ibinita na ng Arsayo sa Manila at kinumpar ng kapital. Yan ang pinagbili nila ng Mako, uh, ang Rote ni Kinal. Sabi, nakikita niyo yung trace ito, nagtatakbo sa Pilipinas, ngunit dahil hegemonic siya, kontrolado siya sa pinakasuperior no? superior na kultura, nasapawan yung dati na pagsamba, yung medyo sa pinagbili sa community. Sana itong kurdiskurso nito magbunga ng bagong construct at naisayos natin ng totoo at makakulatan na pakipag-ugnayan. Sino man ang pagtawa niyo, alaman, Jesus man, sino man ang susunong kayo, bahala kayo. Maraming salamat. Precisely because the Republic is wary of one particular subgroup, a subgroup unified by a certain theological belief, which is the advantage of that secular Republic. So I, 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 I do suspect the way you do that no one is scared. I mean, people are scared of maximum immigration. But uh, uh, for me, if that is so, then the theoretical consequence is that. Um, the separation of church and state is no, is no big deal anymore because the church will then be on the same level as any other group uh, in the country. In fact, if that's the fear that we are more, we should be more scared of a communist party than of a uh, of loyalty to a party rather than loyalty to a church. Which brings me then to, to uh, the point of Father uh, Rani, of the church as an institution. I think all these rules are designed but especially the equal, the, the, uh, the non-established clause, they are designed to be the church as an organization. When, in fact, there is the other, the other incarnation of a church, which is that of, as a living community of the faithful. And as an organization, then we turn to the establishment clause, but to protect the community of the faithful, we turn to the, uh, to the, uh, to the free exercise of the And which brings us then back to the, to the uh, to the first problem, uh, which is that if we allow this organization uh, to uh, free reign, that organization actually has a lot of power. And for a state, we ignore the, uh, the existence of a private power. And a private power uh, leveraged upon theoretically something uh, uh, punishment in the, in the afterlife is to give too much power uh, to, to, uh, to allow such a power to exist beyond the fold of the of the state. Uh, which brings me finally then to the point of Professor Ferrer, that the separation is actually fiction, that um, that the, the ideal is to integrate. And, um, and which actually is the, the central uh, dilemma of our, of the theory that we inherit from the Enlightenment. That liberal theory will maintain that fiction at least conceptually precisely because one arena, that of the faith, is based upon, um, uh, upon revelation, a 
upon uh, on, on belief, which is beyond question, beyond religion, by um, by secular authorities, by courts, by lawyers. A belief that one uh, gives to his uh, uh, to his uh, to his God, uh, to his maker, independent of the usual methods of philosophy, the usual methods of law, things. Um, I think we just have a few minutes for. Uh,